meet a Muslim who is conservative, unashamed, and bold when it comes to tackling radicals in his own community, as well as people in America who are following the wrong approach when it comes to political correctness and bringing about change in society. My next guest is all of that. Welcome to another episode of Conversations. Conversations is the show where we talk about anything and everything and whatever is on my mind. My guest today is someone that you may not have heard of, but he is making an impact in the world. And I'm going to refer to my notes as I read his introduction. Hassan Iman is a native of Bangladesh who has been living in the UK for 30 years. He ran for the British Parliament in 2005, and he's a member of the UK Conservative Party. But most interesting for us is that he's the author of a new book, United States of Anger, Why Linda Sarsour's Rage and Far Left Violence Cannot Move Mountains. He's that kind of guy. Uh, welcome, Hassan, to Conversations. Thank you, Dr. Swain, uh, an excellent introduction. Thank you. Well, you have been uh, very busy, not just uh, uh, with uh, addressing Linda Sarsour's uh, work, but just generally what's taking place in the world as a whole. Could you tell our viewers a little bit about uh, yourself and just how it is that you came to be uh, conservative as a Muslim, or would you say that most Muslims are conservative and the ones we hear about and read about, maybe they don't represent the community as a whole? Sure, uh, Dr. Swain, uh, can I say before I answer your question that uh, it is an absolute pleasure to speak with you from across the pond. Uh, I think to speak with uh, a well-known academic uh, with considerable experience in race relations, uh, and you've been through the era of Martha, you know, Martin Luther King, and you have five gra graduate degrees, and you've been a professor of a prestigious university. So the privilege is actually mine. And uh, I can assure you that white privilege comes nowhere near the privilege I'm having at this moment in time. Thank you. So uh, to answer your question, so I have, um, I say, so I, I'm a Bangladeshi. I've lived here for, I think, uh, probably over 40 years now in the UK. And um, I have, uh, so for my uh, career, I have w uh, worked in uh, multinational companies. So pharmaceutical companies. And in my spare time, I have delved into politics and my interest in politics grew when I was at school uh, and eventually university. So I studied at the London School of Economics. Um, a good few Americans have uh, seen their study and also Imperial College where, where I did my MBA. So I continued those interests through uh, university. Um, and as you say, I did stand for parliament in 2005, but my interest actually grew obviously before then, but I joined the party in 1995 uh, when I took part and campaigned for the only Asian um, Conservative MP at that time uh, there. Uh, so my interest, I suppose, uh, in the, on these issues grew. I am involved in, at work. I'm involved with diversity and inclusion and uh, a great uh, uh, believer in, in that. And I, I suppose what uh, triggered me to write uh, that book, uh, United States of Anger, was um, I was very disappointed with the level of um, divergence and mm -hmm. um, hate that I've seen, certainly in America and to some extent in the UK and around the world, where the, the murder of George Floyd should have been a unifying issue. And all of us, regardless of our political or religious uh, persuasion, uh, should be allies and are allies against racism. We might have different vehicles of um, what we understand by empowerment for the black and Asian communities. Uh, to answer your other question, Muslims generally are conservative, like, like Christians, uh, and other faith communities. Uh, and, you know, theoretically that should translate into their political decision-making, but more often than not, we find that Asia, uh, Muslims, certainly of Asian extraction, have traditionally 
uh, voted for the Labour Party here in the UK, and I'm sure most of them are Democrats in America. Right. And I had to call out. Well, uh, let me sister. ask you something. Let me interrupt yes. you. Of uh, course. When you, when you talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, I'm wondering: does it mean the same thing to you in the UK as it means to me here in the US? And I, I want I want you to respond before I respond. I don't know what uh, diversity inclusion would mean in the US. I'm assuming they'll be the same thing because in the company I work for is an American company and they have a but diversity here, program. It, it's very steeped in critical race theory. And so with America, it divides the world into pretty much white oppressors and non-white victims. And it argues that racism is permanent. Uh, it's in our DNA. There's nothing you can do about it. The best white people can do is to divest themselves of their whiteness and to divest themselves of the whiteness they have to become consciously anti-racist after they get off off their knees uh, apologizing for being born into the white race and having white ancestors they're supposed to challenge other white people uh, who are engaging in racism right so <laughs> in that case no, there is a divergence in uh, what we mean by diversity inclu inclusion across the pond. And I did actually make this uh, point uh, during one of our company conferences. And when we talk about diversity, I include white communities in that because diversity is about inclusion, including every race, every culture. Uh, th there is a diversity of Asian and black cultures as there is a diversity of white cultures. And there's a lot we can learn from each other. So I start off with that premise that were all inclusive and not necessarily not uh, divergent in the way you presented and critical race theory. Viewpoint? What about viewpoint diversity? Uh, so uh, viewpoint diversity, I haven't heard v of that. View, viewpoint diversity, because pretty much like on the university campuses and in parts of America and with the corporations, it's almost like the bean counting. Uh, some people would like proportional representation but there seems to be less interest in divergent viewpoints. And so someone like me who is conservative uh, and you know, I don't know enough about the UK, my sense of it is that it's quote progressive in a leftist sense, uh, there would not be a, a lot of demand at this time uh, in history for people like me who are black and conservative. And that is a shame. And this particular issue did actually blow up uh, roughly two weeks ago when this, um, I might have sent this to you on email before, the race yes. and um, right. diver, uh, ethnic disparity report was commissioned. And these were the 10 authors, most of them are from the Bain uh, communities. And uh, what was very interesting, um, they, they said that, yes, racism is um, very overt in some cases, but they could not find the evidence of institutional racism. And when that report came out, uh, the amount of vitriol uh, that was, uh, uh, that landed on them uh, through the media, through the critics was absolutely deplorable to the extent that some of them were described, well, uh, Tony Sewell, the lead author, black um, uh, Afro-Caribbean, he was described as a bounty bar uh, for hire, so it's a, it's a chocolate in the UK uh, with <laughs> chocolate on the outside, coconut on the inside. <laughs> well, here and that's an Oreo. It's an Oreo. Okay, yeah, there it is, an Oreo for hire. And the other uh, members were described as servants of the white master, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, and also allies of the Ku Klux Klan. So right. if that isn't racism, what is? So it is very, very disturbing uh, that this has happened. So that's what's happening in the UK at the moment. Well, Hassan, we're going to take a break and we'll be back after this uh, message from my sponsor. Conversations with Dr. Carol Swain is made possible by Cooper Steel, a family owned business that provides the steel fabrications for some of the greatest buildings across the United States. 60 years ago, Kenneth and Faye Cooper founded their company in Shelbyville, Tennessee. Cooper Steel believes in sponsoring Carol Swain because we believe she does. You build strong, you stand strong. What started as a vision and now a nationally recognized and operated company that remains true to its founders' Judeo-Christian values and principles. Cooper Steel is committed to excellence, responsibility, and community. 
Cooper Steel's motto is, build strong, stand strong. They treat their employees and customers like family. Thank you to Cooper Steel for standing strong with conversations with Dr. Carol Swain. Learn more about our generous sponsor at coopersteel.com. I'm back with my guest, Hassan Iman. And Hassan, we were talking about um, what's taking place in the UK with diversity and how people that may have a different viewpoint uh, that they're being labeled much as the way they'd be labeled in the US. Like they call people that are black conservatives, Uncle Tom's, they call us Oreos and uh, probably a lot of other things. I've run out of all the names we're called but you're experiencing that as well. And you've sort of stood up against it. Uh, have they come after you for being uh, conservative or questioning the approach? Uh, not yet, uh, but I'm, I'm ready for it. Uh, my approach is that uh, we should engage in civil discourse, civil debate, and it, it is a debate, and I have approached and contacted, tried to contact uh, the fierce critics of the report. They, they are largely uh, uh, leaning on the left side of politics, which is why they've been uh, very vitriolic against the report. But the uh, solution is that we engage in uh, proper debate and I'm, I'm waiting for a response for them. Now, I think we can rise above the politics because I keep on mentioning, I've mentioned on radio here in the UK, we are all allies against racism. So the civil discourse needs to be there. And in this book, uh, United States of um, Anger, you, you may have read that, I have yes. tried to engage with some people on the extreme left with a view that we can come towards uh, uh, some form of common ground. That's how we, we learn, you know, uh, that's how we learn from each other. Well, I mean, I, I wish you much success because in America on the college campuses, there is no such thing as debate because conservatives are finding themselves, quote, canceled, but not just conservatives, even people who are classical liberals, secular humanists, they have all the right credentials. Any day they could say something and find themselves uh, targeted. And so even if you are anti-racist by definition and you have all your, uh, you've checked all the boxes, they can turn on you with a moment's notice. And so we don't have the uh, debate that we associate with classical liberalism. Well, uh, that's very unfortunate. I have noticed that in America, a huge polarization of opinion uh, which is a shame really because uh, America, although I like to think that Britain, Bangladesh are you know, <laughs> some of the best countries in the world, mm -hmm. America by far is the most advanced country in the world. A lot of people do want to emigrate, emigrate there. So it is very surprising to me that there is so much intolerance in America from either, either side when you know, building bridges should, should be the order of the day. So I hope that that can actually change. We haven't had this year here yet in the, in the UK. I think there is scope still for, for uh, debate. So you feel that universities in the UK, uh, that they're still marketplaces of ideas and people with divergent uh, viewpoints can survive on the faculty and uh, they can, their jobs are secure. There's not a punishment like in the US for expressing your views. I must say, I haven't actually come across uh, conservative academics at, at university, so I can't really answer Because that they question. don't exist? Probably, <laughs> probably, or if they do exist, uh, they're in hiding, uh, which is why when, when I came across your book, uh, Be the People, uh, it was actually quite refreshing to read uh, an academic uh, talk about the religious foundations uh, uh, and the value of religion and the reasons why America was uh, uh, um, created by the founding fathers. And when you, um, I, I like one of the quotes in your book where you said, end the hate, let debate. Right. That really should be the order of the day, uh, I think. Um, but in the media here, we have the BBC. Um, it is relatively neutral. They will invite uh, both sides uh, uh, of the opinion. Unlike uh, CNN and Fox News, where they're completely divergent, uh, and the types of guests they're going to invite. Uh, it, it is a shame, really. That but I have to tell you about BBC. Like, they have me, they've had me on uh, rather frequently, you know, right. probably five or six times in the last year. But what I find is that I am their 
uh, to represent, you know, the token conservative viewpoint. And several times I've gotten in arguments with the hosts who are telling me that I'm wrong about something I'm right about because right. I guess they read on CNN or New York Times or one of those leftist sources an alternative viewpoint. And so with BBC, I, I would still do that show, but um, I find um, uh, T TRN, Turkish World News, uh, much more open, even though they uh, sort of lean to leftists too. But um, they are Interesting. more polite, I think, than some of the BBC hosts. Oh, that's, uh, sorry to hear that. I, I'm, if I do become a member of parliament, I'll be sure that you know, it's, <laughs> can be rectified. Um, yeah, and as part of the discourse, you know, I, I do write on uh, Medium, um, and that is, a, I'd say, basically a left-wing um, uh, media platform. But today I submitted an article, a published an article, where I said I... As a conservative, I do support the uh, Marxist um, co-founder of Black Lives Matter, Patrice Collors. You, you, now, do, why, support, you do support I do her. support her in one aspect. Sorry. Yeah, well, uh, Don't worry, we're not going to have a falling out here. What, what I support, aspect? <laughs> well, the aspect is that she recently purchased uh, a house for $1.4 million right. in a lovely enclave in Los Angeles. And in the uh, Global Black Lives Matter Foundation, it does actually state in there you just don't want to talk about black death, but black empowerment and success. Well, this is what this report was actually talking about, uh, right. black Asian successes. And this is a prime example of someone with a Marxist ideology, but in practice, doing what capitalists and conservatives would do to better their future, the family's future. So we as conservatives should, should really uh, rally behind her and support her, and not just her, but other you know, BAME communities who want to prosper. Well, I'll, the other thing about her uh, new home is that it's in a part of California where I think the percentage of Blacks is something like, you know, 0. 0.0004. Uh, she is not going to have very few Black neighbors. She probably won't encounter any. And so she won't be concerned about police or, or crime, the kind of levels she would have if she were in a community that was more diverse. And, uh, you know, people may find what I just said politically incorrect, but we know that the higher the percentage of certain uh, ethnic groups, the higher the crime rate. And so she has moved to a place where she can probably leave her doors unlocked. Yes, that, that's interesting. That's very interesting to know. And every uh, BAME and even white folks in the, in the lower uh, class should have that opportunity to prosper and develop, so that, that's great. So, and that's not surprising because here in the UK, we've had Labour politicians who heavily criticised conservative policies on education, for example, private education or selective education, only to send their children to, to those schools. So it's not surprising that uh, they would operate on the principle that uh, do as I say, but not as I do. Well, you, we used to call them limousine liberals. You know, they wanted school integration for everyone else. They wanted all these things, but, you know, they sent their own kids to private schools. And even with issues like uh, race-based affirmative action, what we have found in the past is that uh, among the liberals that have pushed it the hardest, they were the ones, because of their connections as elites and the old boys system and the old girls system, or you can just pick up the phone and call someone and open up doors, they were not affected by the way that working class people or, or more middle class people would be affected. Uh, we're going to have to take another break and we return. Uh, I want you to talk about affirmative action and how it uh, relates to the diversity, equity and inclusion industry and some of the other issues you talk about. We'll be back uh, after this break. Dr. Carol Swain's Be the People, a call to reclaim America's faith and promise, newly released in paperback and audio with a new introduction, is a challenge to all Americans. If you are serious about being the best citizen you can be, this is the book for you. From addressing moral relativism to reclaiming the future, you'll understand why Dr. Swain is one of the most relevant voices in today's culture war. Are you ready to reclaim America's faith and promise? Purchase at bethepeoplenews.com front slash books or wherever books are sold. 
The Biden administration's executive order on immigration brings to the forefront one of the most volatile issues of our time. In this timely second edition of Debating Immigration, I join my voice to that of other experts to provide you with facts and information that will help you understand what is at stake for our nation. This edition offers 21 original essays that cover race, religion, economics, human smuggling, and civil rights. Purchase at bethepeoplenews.com front slash books or wherever books are sold. I'm back with my uh, guest, Hassan Iman, and we're talking about uh, issues that relate to conservatism. He's a, cons- he's a Muslim in the UK, and obviously I'm here in Nashville, a conservative, and we've come together. And one of the things that uh, interests both of us is whether or not Christians and Muslims can work together when there are areas of shared interest, because we do share the first five books of the Bible along with Jews. And, uh, and so we are all the uh, people of the book. And so uh, Hassan, what do, you, what do you think? And why um, is it such a divergent? I think we do know why <laughs> there's so much um, distrust between Christians and Muslims, and a lot of it has to do with the violence against Christians in the Middle East and parts of the world. Yes, yes, and also, you know, uh, post 9-11, there has been a lot of um, uh, concern and fear amongst the non-Muslims about uh, the Muslim community. In fact, I think you've heard of Katie Hopkins. Uh, She's a conservative. She moved to the US. And I I do remember engaging with her when she was a radio host uh, that although these are a minority uh, who are terrorists, they go against Islam, they go against the Quran in terms of uh, killing innocent people, that we as Muslim community should actually uh, rise up and condemn them even more so. And I've tried to do that myself when I stood for parliament. I did uh, issue a challenge to one of the uh, extremists uh, who supported Al Qaeda, um, uh, but they did not accept my invitation because they knew uh, they could not win the debate when it comes to trying to prove the Quran supports terrorism. So I wasn't going to allow them to do that. So the fear is there. Um, but I think the positive side is, uh, as you said, uh, the term people of the book is used in the Quran to describe Jews and Christians. And there is a verse, uh, it, it says on in chapter three, verse 64, uh, O people of the book, let us come to common terms between us and you that we worship none but God, etc., etc. So we start on the basis of co- what is uh, common. And I'm happy to say that Christians and Muslims and other faith communities have actually engaged in dialogue and debate since I can remember from the 1980s and it's largely been about theology uh, and whilst that is very very important because it is about salvation whilst we're talking about that let's save some lives whilst we are on this earth so since 1973 when one billion babies were killed through abortion you know we need to work together because uh, this is actually against Islam as well as Judeo-Christianity but you know something here yeah. in America, I, I never hear any Muslims talking about abortion. And as far as distrust between Christians and Muslims, I think that it has to do with the the verses in the Quran that talks about killing the inf- infidel. And we hear about, okay, if you kill the infidel, you know, you get these 70 virgin brides. That is mostly what we hear. Uh, and I don't know what the answer is because there are many people that they feel like Islam itself is the problem and what they see describes the whole religion. Sure, and I have heard uh, discourses by uh, Robert Spencer, uh, Pamela Geller, uh, who would, uh, and Bridget Gabrielle, who would be of that viewpoint. But I think this is where dialogue uh, and debate is actually necessary in, in a civil discourse. If there are people see problems with Islam, definitely, you know, we should not... Uh, um, be afraid to uh, rise up to challenge and debate and discourse and come to some form of understanding. In terms of the verse you referred to about killing infidels, I mean, this is in the context of warfare, where warfare is actually uh, permitted, uh, but it can't be the uh, aggressor, but there is uh, self-defense. So killing is, is mentioned in that context. But, but also that particular verse uh, is followed by another verse that says, uh, when an enemy soldier comes uh, to you then um, in, in, in peace, then take them to a place of uh, peace and security. So, and this 
predated the Geneva Conventions of uh, you know, POWs. So it's things like these platforms like these, we can overcome um, uh, ignorance. And I think there's been a gap between the Muslim scholars in America and some of the uh, people I've mentioned who do criticize Islam, that there needs to be more uh, dialogue and debate. And certainly on the issue of where we do have commonality, commonality like abortion, uh, like in the Quran in chapter 17, it does say, do not kill your children for fear of right. poverty. Right. This is extended to abortion. Uh, and that's why um, I was very frustrated when Linda Sarr saw Ilhan Omar when they speak uh, to Muslim groups and imams, there is no challenge back. And this is a fundamental issue of the sanctity of life and they're not challenged back. So I hope you do engage in dialogue with uh, you know, people on the left. Well, they don't challenge back because they're afraid. If they're part of the Democratic Party, they have, you know, they're the party of abortion. And to the extent that they are, you know, allies with, uh, whether it's China or with the uh, radical Muslims, the radical Muslims and the people that have an agenda, you know, they're going to be on the same page. They're not going to undermine each other's position on anything. Well, that's the thing. Uh, and I think I mentioned in the book that um, she, she, Linda would have an image to uphold and some relations to you don't ruffle the feathers. And I think that is uh, completely wrong. And there are values that we both share Jews, Christians, Muslims, Hindu, Sikhs, or whatever. And it, so on that platform, we should be uniting. And it is uh, very interesting that it, as far as the politics is concerned, a lot of Muslims here in the UK and America have come down on the side of socialism and the left, whereas right. in mm -hmm. terms of the values, that's actually uh, reflected in the conservative side of politics. So this discrepancy is really, really interesting. And I try to challenge that as well. Uh, I'm not saying that conservatives have a monopoly on religion, they don't. Um, and in fact, uh, you might have heard of Andrew, uh, Reverend Andrew Wilkes or Christian Socialism. I've tried right. to contact him to understand this because there seems to be a contradiction there. Um, but let's, uh, let, let's, let's talk, let's challenge each other. Well, when you say you know, that you're a conservative Muslim and your work uh, and your life uh, demonstrates that, uh, how do you respond when people in their mind, they might think you're radical if you're not progressive? How does a conservative Muslim fit in? Do you, do you find that that might run through people's minds because they try to simplify? So you're a conservative Muslim. Uh, they uh, think radical uh, sometimes, or they think, uh, then I'm, I'm not sure that when people are putting people in boxes, where they put you? I don't know actually, because I've asked myself that question. I don't know where I put, uh, put myself. Um, I would not be considered a, a, certainly a radical. I mean, because I, I pray and you know, tomorrow is the month of, uh, start of the month of Ramadan, I fast. Because I Linda, be... is, Linda is a radical and the radicals, are they more likely uh, to be associated with, you know, support for uh, violence and terrorism as a way to achieve their goals? So when you say radical, is that the radical left or radical Muslim for a religious point of view? Uh, radical, okay, radical Muslim, and then there's secular Muslims, right? Right, okay. And then... It's a fluid, it's a fluid. Right. Yeah, it's a fluid definition. Um, no, I, I will be, uh, I mean, I don't know how Sir Linda Sarsen will regard me. Uh, she'll uh -huh. probably regard me, certainly not a, a radical from a religious viewpoint, but certainly a, a conservative. Um, I mean, when I've engaged with conservative you know, in the realm of politics, uh, after the 9-11 attacks at the party, our party conference, I quoted my favorite verse from the Quran, uh, chapter 49, verse 13, which talks about um, the, the unity of mankind and, we, uh, and superiority is determined by how good a person you are, not by the skin color. Right. And incidentally, that was actually um, also we are, quoted by Prime Minister. We're coming to the end of our show, pretty much. I will have to have you on, but I want to give you this time to tell our guests how they can uh, find out more about you. Sure. No, well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Swain. It's been an absolute pleasure to uh, speak with you and your team. And uh, I think you said earlier on that uh, you don't know much about uh, you know, what's happening in the UK. So I formally invite you to the United Kingdom uh, when the pandemic is over. You, you certainly will be a guest. You are in my home at the moment, but I think well, officially you. it would be great. So in my final few moments, I'll say that, uh, you know, peace and blessings to all of you, those who are listening. Um, and 
the, the Islamic greeting that says, uh, may the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. I, I leave you with that. But certainly in terms of the discourse and politics, uh, we, the left and the right need, need to engage with each other, build bridges with each other to avoid, uh, so we don't fall into the uh, quagmire of radicalisms. And I really hope this can happen. I'm trying my level best, although <laughs> um, well, let's you. see what happens. Yeah. Thank you so much. And your website? I don't have a website at the moment, but uh, my YouTube name is a Reasonable Conservative. Reasonable Conservative. Right. So they can have a look at uh, my uh, my videos. Thank you so much for being on the show, and I will have you uh, back on and uh, look forward to a debate, more debates. Thank you, Dr. Swain. It's a pleasure. We'll be back uh, after this moment from our sponsors. For those of you who would like to know what exactly our children are facing in their education system, this is a must read book. It will equip you and prepare you to make decisions about your child's health, about your child's education. So I wanna encourage every one of you to grab a copy of Dr. Swain's book and join with me and Carol on the front lines in this critical time to eradicate the liberal abduction of our children. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Conversations. We talk about anything and everything. I hope you enjoyed uh, this guest. Tune in again next week.